It's good to be back here again tonight. Had a great service this morning and just looking forward to what God has in store for tonight. God's been good. I like that song by the Eddie saying. Don't call, you call me part of so don't call me blind. <laughs> I'm no longer blind. I, I like that. We're going to be in the book of 1 Kings chapter 21 tonight. First Kings chapter twenty one. There's one thing I know. I know we need a move of God in this generation. Amen. You know, we have a generation that has never seen the power of Christ. You know, my generation and under have never seen the reality of God. And it breaks my heart just to know that, you know, we need to make Christ real in this generation. I have a niece that's five and a little nephew that's 11 years old. And, and I just think every day, God, what if I die and don't bring them a reality? What if I die and don't show them who you are and put for, for, for a reality? Not just going to church, not just going through the motion, not some little feeling, some little dance, but a reality of the power of God. The, the same power of God that set me free. You know, I grew up in church all my life. I went to Victor Temple, the church where the Clinton found it. 19 years I went through the same routine. I knew how to pray. I knew when to say amen. I cried. I went to the altar. I did it all. I never gave my heart to Jesus. When I went to college, I got off in a bad way. I started doing things that I'd never done in my life. And it kind of scared me. Just, you know, never been into the, the depths of sin that I got to in college. And I went back home. I graduated in 2006 with the college that fall. I went back home. I, I didn't go back to college. I went back to a college in Beaumont. I went back home and that summer, 2007, Brother Clendenin was teaching the School of Christ. And it started that Sunday morning. He was going to start that School of Christ. Now, I love Brother Clendenin to death, but I hated him then. He was an old man. I'm 19. I didn't want to hear him talk. He, he used to talk for hours, it seemed like to me. Like, man, I didn't like him at all. I was, just, I was going to skip the service. I was like, no, I'm going to go. I'm going to just go hear what he has to say. And I couldn't tell you what he preached from. I couldn't tell you one word he said. But the man made Christ real to me. He, he, he gave Christ. They gave me a reality of who Christ was. And I just pray. That's my prayer. God, let me make you real in this generation. I don't want to preach a good sermon. I don't want people to amen, shout. I don't care about booking meetings, money, anything else in this world. I just want to make you real. 19 years, I grew up in church, but one day a man decided to be, go beyond the confines of religion and make Christ a reality to my life. And I just thank him so much for that. I just thank God so much for that, that he still has men and women that are there to say whatever, whatever the world says, I'll stand for truth. Whatever everybody else goes for, I'll go for the truth of the word of God. And I just thank God for having men and women that will still do that. But I'm telling you folks, we need more of them. We need to go deeper than we've ever been. We need to climb new heights higher than we've ever been before. It's a dark day out there and we must have a reality of God. If we don't have a move of God soon, there'll be a generation that'll say, God's dead. And we don't want that to be said about this, about America. There was a quote that Thomas Jefferson said. He was a, one of the presidents, but he wasn't saved. He wasn't a born again man. But there's a quote he said. He said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that His justice cannot sleep forever. He said, I tremble when I think of my country I know that God is a just God and His justice will not sleep forever. Since then, we've gone to, to deeper and darker sins in His day, but He said He trembled. I ask you, how many of us tremble when we think about the, the sin of this world? Do I tremble when I see the state of America? When I see the state of these countries I've been to? Do I tremble at the state of them? God's just and His justice will not sleep forever. I think about that, folks. It just that stirs my soul every time I think about it. God, where where is my prayer? Is where is my mindset? Where is my heart? I don't have the heart of Christ like I should have it. Why don't I? It's because I don't want the heart of Christ like I want to. As a man by the name of William Law, he's a great writer. He wrote in the 1600s. But in his book I was reading, it's called A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. He talks about, uh, through the whole book, just a devout life to Christ. But during the first part of the book, he says that he was talking about the Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, just great men of God through history. And he said, why are you not as pious? Why are you not as holy? Why are you not at the same level as these men? He said, if you stopped here and questioned your life, he said, it wouldn't be from a lack of understanding and it wouldn't be from a lack of ability, but it would be for one reason you never intended to be. Like, my God, I understand the Word of God as good as they understood it. I have the ability to do everything that they do, but I don't do it simply because I never desire to. 
I never earnestly gave myself to the place where God can use me. I never came to the place enough where I said, God, everything that I am, you take it and do what you want with it. Peter, Paul, James, John, every single one of them, Luther, Wesley, the Zusa Street Revival, the Wells Revival, all great moves of God because a man dared to say, I want to make you real in this generation. A man dared to say, I'm tired of going through the routines. I'm tired of going through the most. I'm tired of just having the same old church. Church is good. I'm glad we have an opportunity to come to church. But my God, let's go beyond just having church. Let's see God move in this generation. Let's have revival. I want my little nephew to know that God is still real. I want my niece to know God is still real. I don't want them to be like me. Go through 19 years of religion and never meet Christ. How many people today sit on the, on the, the pews of a church are going to die and go to hell because they've never been born again. They've never had a relationship with Christ. Their eyes have never been enlightened to the truth of the gospel. And it's only because people like me, people like you, never made them real. My God, folks, that makes me weep inside. We need a reality of Christ. The first generation of Pentecost in this new age since Azusa Street Revival, they had the ability to make Christ real. And they, when they went to a town, went to a place where God wasn't real, they could make Him real. They could find Him and they could make Him. Wherever they went, they brought Christ with them. That second generation fell off a little bit. The 50s, the 60s, the 70s, they fell off a little bit. They could find reality, but they couldn't produce reality. Now my generation, we're in a place we can't find it and we can't produce it. Folks, we're in a scary position. We're in a scary time. And I believe that God truly desires desires to revive His people. I believe God desires to revive His church. I believe He wants to pour out His Spirit mightily among us, but we must first allow Him to. We must first say, God, this is Your vessel. Do with it what You want. Do with it what You will. No matter what it costs You, my God, I'll pay that price. You know, we don't have revival most of the time because the cost is too high for revival. We're not willing to pay it. But the price wasn't too high for my Christ to die for me. The price shouldn't be too high for me to live for Him. Amen? Amen. 1 Kings 21, chapter, verse 1. My mouth's been really dry today. I don't know why. Forgive me, but I drink a lot. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard to the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. I mean, right, it was right next to the palace. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have, that I may have it for a garden of herds, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee a better vineyard than it. Or, it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee it the worth of it and money. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbiddeth me that I should give thee the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Going to pray. Father, I just thank you for another opportunity to worship you. Another opportunity to come to your house, God, and magnify your name. God, I beg of you, speak to your people. Speak to me. God, move in this service. Move in this church. Though we be few in numbers, God, we're mighty through your spirit. We just ask ask you to sweep the nations, God, through this place. God, just move ever so mightily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love this story. You see here, King Ahab, the king, the ruler of, uh, of the day. And, and, and Maboth was just a simple man. He was just a servant. He was, he was uh, left, left an inheritance of his, of his garden. It was right next to the palace. It was a goodly place. It was good to produce fruit. It was good for what it was. And Ahab said, I want that garden. It's close to my house, and it's good. The soil is good. It produces good fruit. I can have good and great use of that. And he went to Naboth and said, Give me of your garden. And Naboth said, I it offered, the Lord forbids me to give of my inheritance. Folks, I'm telling you, the church of the 21st century, we had an inheritance of God. That inheritance was Pentecost, and we sold that inheritance. He said, I'll give you money for it, or I'll give you a better vineyard. We've taken money for it, and we've taken a false reality of the things of God. Folks, we sold the inheritance that God gave us. We sold the inheritance that He gave us for something else of this world. He went to Naboth. Naboth, I'll give you the exact same thing or the exact amount of money that it's worth. 
Nabal said, the Lord forbid it. I will not take a counterfeit of the reality that God has left me. But the church of the 21st century, we have taken a counterfeit of the reality that God left us. On the day of Pentecost, He poured out His Spirit mightily upon His people. They walked in the strength and the power of God. They saw the blinded eyes open. They saw the deaf and ears open. They saw the dumb talk, the lame walk. They saw the miracles and the mighty signs and wonders of God. They had an inheritance on that day. When they died, they, they gave this inheritance to each and every one of us. But Ahab came to us and one night he knocked on our doors and he said, give me of your garden. I want of that garden. He said, I'll give you a garden just like it. I'll give you a taut tongue. I'll give you a taut dance. I'll give you a taut shout. I'll give you a same emotion that'll make you run around this building. Folks, we sold the inheritance that God, that God gave us on the day of Pentecost for a cheap counterfeit. And you see where it's brought us at today. We're in the darkest generation that the world has ever seen. All because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ did not stand for truth. They did not say the Lord forbid me to give it. But they gave up, they gave up the inheritance that God gave them. We've given away the inheritance that God has given us, folks. And we must wake up to the realization. We bought in a cheap counterfeit. We sing the same. We shout the same. But the power thereof is not behind it. We come, sick people come through our church and they leave sick. The dying come and they leave in a graveyard. We don't have the power of Pentecost that they had back then. We don't have a reality of God like they had back then. We fill the pews up with young people. We get them playing games, give them ice cream and cookies, but they never experience the reality of being born again. They never come to the place where their lives are totally transformed by the power of God. They say amen. They read the right scriptures. They know how to act in front of mom and daddy. They know how to pray and, and make up a few tears, but the reality of being birthed of God is no longer in them. The devil knocked on our door, folks, and he said, I have the same thing at a cheaper cost. I have the same thing, but it's a little easier to get to. You have to walk all the way up to my palace, but you don't have to anymore. You can just walk outside your door and get it. Folks, you've got to be bought a cheap counterfeit of the reality of God, and it's left us in a bad state. It's left us in a bad way. It's left the church naked and powerless. It's left us destitute. we left us in a place that God never intended for us to be. That first generation could make God real. That second generation could find it. But this generation has no reality of God whatsoever. We leave the churches on a Sunday or a Wednesday. We go down the streets and nobody thinks anything different of us. My God, folks, what happened to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? What happened to her? The Bible says that we're more than overcomers through Christ. The Bible says He maketh her triumph in all things through Christ. But now all I see is a weak church barely making it from Sunday to Sunday. We come crawling one Sunday, we leave out running. By Wednesday we're crawling again. There's no strength in it. There's no vitality. There's no vigor in it. When God birthed that church on Pentecost, it was birthed young, birthed in strength, birthed in power. Now we're weak. We're maimed. We have no ability within us to do what God has called us to do. All because we bought a cheap counterfeit. We settled for that which was easy to get to. It was more easily accessible to Naboth to have that other field. But he said, the Lord forbid me to sell it. The Lord forbid me to sell it. But in this generation, we said we'll sell it. And we'll sell it a cheap yeah. counterfeit. And look what it's cost us, folks. It's cost us our children. It's cost us our grandchildren. Our churches split over the color of the carpet today. Why? They weren't born again in the first place. We fill our house with tears and we never noticed the difference. The Holy Spirit walked out 30 years ago and we're just now noticing He's gone. My God, we sold the inheritance that God had given us on the day of Pentecost for a cheap counterfeit and it's time that we wake up and realize it. We gave the inheritance of God away. God purchased that inheritance with His own blood and we freely say, take it Ahab. 
take it, whatever you want. Ahab was the husband of Jezebel. Jezebel is a, a, the, the Jezebel spirit, the mixture of flesh and spirit. That's what she represents in this Bible. That's what Ahab represented, and that's what he was trying to sell Naboth. I'll give you a tongue and a dance, but I want you to live like the world lives. I'll give you a shout, but I want you to do everything the world does with no strength, no power, no vitality, no reality of the things of God. And we bought into his lie today. We sound like a Pentecostal, but we don't live like a Pentecostal. We sound like one, but we surely don't have the power of one. We don't walk in the strength and the power that God has called us to walk in. I'm talking about myself, a reality of the things of God, to be birthed in this place. He said, I'll give you a vineyard just like that, or I'll give you money for it. There was a Pope, his name was Pope Innocent. And a man walked into his office. He was counting a, a large sum of money. This was in uh, 11, 14 or something. He, he gave him. A, he was he walked in his office. He was counting a large sum of money. He said, "See, young man, the church can no longer say that we have silver and gold, have I not?" And the young man replied, "Neither can she say, rise up and walk." You see, folks, we traded silver and gold for the strength and the power of the Holy Ghost. We traded money and big buildings. We traded fancy cars and nice clothes. We traded all these things for the reality of the strength and the power of God. We've given up everything that Christ died for. We've sold the inheritance of our forefathers that changed the world. The Bible says that 120 men woke up in the upper room and when they went out into the world, the world said they turned it upside down. Or these the men that have turned this nation upside down. But what do they say about us? There's a church on every corner preaching every Sunday and Wednesday but nobody sees the reality of God. We've sold the inheritance folks. we bought a cheap counterfeit. we sold it for silver and gold. And it's left us naked and destitute in the 21st century. It breaks and grieves my heart. I've been other countries of this world. Missionaries on every corner. Churches on every corner. But they've never seen the reality of the gospel. Folks, we must return to Christ and Christ alone. We must return to the reality of the Spirit of God. We must once more say devil, you'll not take my inheritance. The Lord forbid me. You can bribe me with everything you want. You can try to give me with everything you want, but I will not sell my inheritance. Naboth, the very name of it meant fruit. By God is life for the fruit of Christ. Do our lives bear the fruit of Christ? Do our lives speak and testify of the Lord Jesus Himself? Naboth's life testified of it because he stood and said, I will not sell my inheritance. I will not give it away. I will not accept your cheap counterfeit. You can give me all the silver and gold you want. I will not take it. My God, folks, the very name of the man meant fruit. Fruit. He was abundant of fruit for the things of God because he refused to sell out. He refused to sell his inheritance. He refused to take a cheap counterfeit by God. We're, we're, we think Pentecost is coming on a, on a Sunday night speaking in tongues and, and leaving a building. That's not a reality of Pentecost, folks. That's not a reality of the power of God. On the day of Pentecost, yes, they did speak in tongues, but the very next thing they went outside and preached and won 3,000 of Christ. Pentecost comes, and the Bible says when you fill with the Holy Ghost, you'll be a witness unto God. you have to be filled with the power of God. You can walk Lord, and not sin. You can walk the Above the dominion of sin, you can live righteously and holy before God with the power and the strength of the Holy Ghost. We don't see that much anymore. But Pastor here was talking about one of the men that used to be over this church. He said he pastored here for years, but turns around and left his wife for another woman. He wasn't filled and possessed with the strength of God. He bought a cheap counterfeit. He never had a reality of God. He settled for that which was easy. He refused to pay the price of what it took to keep the inheritance of God. He refused to pay that price. He sold out to that Jezebel system. That system of a mixture of flesh and spirit. That mixture that the Bible says God hates. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm. And lukewarm and a Jezebel spirit. I'd rather you be cold, ice cold, know nothing. I hate the name of God than to be lukewarm. He said He'll spew you out of your out of His mouth. And we've become that in this generation. we become a lukewarm Christianity which God despises in which the world mocks at. The Goliath stands at our door and mocks us continually like he did Israel. There needs to be a David that rises up and says, this Philistine will no longer mock the name of my God. Amen. 
this man, this ungodly man, will no longer mock the name of this King of Kings. My God, folks, it breaks my heart. Seven billion people live on this earth, and I wonder how many truly have ever met the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you earlier that two billion people have never heard the name of Christ, and it's all because we sold out for a cheap inheritance. We sold our inheritance for a cheap counterfeit. We've given everything of the reality of God away. My God, folks, America, since Roe versus Wade have aborted over 50 million babies. But worldwide, every year, we abort 50 million babies because there is no church to shine a light of Christ. There is no Holy Spirit to resist and restrain the evil that's found in this day. There have been 17,000 people that's died in Syria on these recent conflicts and, uh, between the, the, uh, the Civil War and that country. There's nobody there to shine the light of Christ. My God, folks, does it make you weak that one out of ten in this country is a homosexual? One out of every four young girls that you pass by on the street have been molested by the age of twelve because there's no Spirit of God to refrain them, to resist them, no Spirit of God to keep back that evil of the day. It's all because we sold our inheritance. It's all because nobody stood like Naboth and said, you will not have my inheritance. I will walk in the strength and the power of God no matter what what it cost me. If I read down a little bit further, you'll figure out that it cost Naboth his life for that. And that's what it's going to cost you and I to, to have this inheritance of God. We might not be martyred. We might not end up dead for it. But folks, it'll cost us everything on that altar to experience the power of Pentecost once more. We must truly come and lay everything of our lives on the altar. We, 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 it's become cliche to sing the song, I Surrender All. That song must be more than words from our lips, but it must be a reality in our lives. The book of Acts must not be a, a good book to study and do Sunday schools on, but it must come a reality of God. Do down said in his last camp meeting, let's stop talking about the book of Acts and let's experience it once more. Let somebody get a hold of the horns of the altar and say, God, I won't let go till you move in my life. I won't let go till you fill me once more like they had on that day. I won't let go of you, God, till you become a reality in my heart, a reality in my soul. I won't don't let go till I make you real in this generation once more. Yeah. Folks, we need a reality of God. We desperately need Christ to move yeah. in this last generation. Amen. Song of Solomon 4, verse 16. The Bible says, let me get a drink real quick. It says, O north wind, awake, O north wind, and come thy south, blow upon my garden, that these spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. You see, this is the Shulamite woman speaking to King Solomon. She was asking him to blow upon her and make her fruitful. It was the, it's the same cry of the church of God to breathe upon her once more so she can bear the fruit of his son Jesus Christ through their lives. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of God, saith the Lord. And we knew that the, the Shulamite woman knew that in my own strength, in my own ability, I'm nothing but an old maid girl. I can't do anything on my own. But Solomon, you're the king of all kings in that time, in that generation. Blow upon me. We must come to Christ with the same desperation, with the same mindset and same attitude. God, I'm nothing. But if you breathe upon me, I can do great things. If you breathe upon me once more. Awake, O oh north wind. Breathe upon my life. She was begging him. Awake and breathe on me. She wasn't saying if you want to. She desperately went and shook him. Wake up. Breathe on me. I want to produce the fruits of God. I want to live a life of Christ. I want a reality in this generation. Wake up, O oh Spirit of God. Breathe on me. It's time that the church gets back to this. It gets back to the reality. We need the wind of God to blow in this place. We need the wind of God to blow in our lives. The word blow in the Hebrew is puat. It means the breath, to breathe or to exhale. Genesis 2 7, the Bible says, The Lord God formed man in the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. He got down in that dirt. He made man with his finger. He formed him. He shaped him. He put the spleen where it was supposed to be. He put the heart where it was supposed to be. He had everything in his proper place, but without the breath of God. It was just a corpse lying there. My God, folks, we need the wind of God to blow in the church once more. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost living in and through our lives once more. The Bible says that Ezekiel saw those bones come together bone to his bone. Everyone in his proper place. But he didn't get excited there. 
He said, God, it only won't be anybody until you breathe life in it, until you bring a reality to it. God breathed and it became real. It became a fighting force that the world has never seen. Adam was there formed in the ground and he breathed the breath of God on him. Wind of God breathe on me. Wind of God blow on Red Lake Baptist. Breathe on your church today. Breathe in this generation once more. I need you, God. I need your strength. I need your power. I need your vitality. I need you, Jesus, to breathe on my life. I'm tired of preaching sermons. I beg God, don't let me preach another message without the reality of Christ in my life. Don't let me witness to another soul without the reality of Christ in my life. Oh, North Wind, blow upon me, my God. Blow upon me. Let the wind of God blow in this place. Let the wind of God blow in this house. Let Christ blow upon his God. Blow upon his people. Proverbs 25, 23 says, The north wind brings forth rain, and so does the backbiting tongue bring forth an angry countenance. Job 37, 17 how thy garments are worn when he quit, when he cried at the earth by the south wind. Psalms 53 says, O God, shall, O our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be a very tempest round about him. You see that north wind was a reprover. It brings that rain. When that rain comes, it clears the air. It clears the sky. Dust particles are everywhere. But if you ride by after a, a fresh rain, it just drops. You see the clarity, the crispness of the air. All the things that were hid behind the smog are revealed now. Those clouds and that dust that hid that mountain when that rain Rain falls and goes away. I can see the clarity and the height and the depth of that mountain and that valley. Everything is revealed within the reprover it came. It exposed everything in our lives for what it is. It brings the conviction of God upon our life. That's the point of the north wind. That's what that sure my girl said. I'm not strong enough. I have faults. I have failures. But my God breathes upon me. Let that north wind come upon my life. Why? Show me who I am. Show me what I am. By God, show me the wretched state that I am in. Reveal the life of sin within me. Reveal the area of my life that I refuse to give you. Reveal that in my life which I cling to this world and not to the cross. Everything in my life that's against thee and not of thee. Show it to me. Breathe, North Wind. Breathe in this house. Breathe upon my life. Everything that hinders and keeps me from going on with God. Reveal it today. God will never reveal but show you something. Come against you, but you're sinning your life if he's not willing to take it out. The Shulamite woman knew that. He was saying, Solomon, breathe on me. Show me my failures. Show me my faults. Because she knew Solomon would pick her up at the end of it. If we be honest with God today, show me my faults. Show me my failures. Let the north wind expose his heart for what it is. She knew the south wind was soon behind. She knew the south wind was coming up very quickly behind her. The south wind is the comforter. It brings the fire of the Holy Ghost, which consumes and leaves us burning bright for God. So the Holy Ghost first, clearing away the mist of gloom, of error, of unbelief, of sin, which hinders the light of Jesus Christ to shine forth from our lives. Then sending spiritual warmth, causing the garden to release her precious odors, causing the children of God to release the precious graces of God, causing the children of God to shine their lights into a darkened world. The Shulamite that woman said, Oh Solomon, blow upon me. Oh Solomon, blow upon me. North wind expose me for who I am. Oh south wind, come and cleanse. Come and fire, burn a fire in my bosom. Come and do a great work in me. The church needs to once more realize we need the breath of God. We need the wind of God. We have the Bible. We have greater teachings than most people ever had back in the back in history. We have all these things, but yet we're we're powerless, yet we're naked and destitute in this generation. It's because we've forsaken the Spirit of God. We think for some reason we can do it in our own strength, in our own power. We think we can do it all on our own. But Zechariah says, not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, says God. We need the Holy Ghost once more. By God, more than a little tongue, but a reality of who He is. North wind breathes on me. 
south wind, come and blow, come and set my soul ablaze for you. You go to most churches, when they say God come down, all they did was shout, all they did was jump, all they did was run around. But when God meets His people with a fresh north wind of God, He brings first repentance and then He consumes everything of your life with the fire of the Holy Ghost. Then comes the shout, then comes the joy, then comes the life and the reality of God. Oh, north wind, breathe upon me. South wind, come and breathe upon me so my God can release its precious odors toward you. My God, breathe upon me. The Shulamite woman didn't only ask, but she demanded, Arise, get up, and breathe on me. You see, it's not disrespectful to demand God to breathe on us. God wants His people. The violent take it by force. In prayer, God, You breathe on me. God, I don't want You to move in my life. It's those who are lukewarm that are sitting there and say, If you want to, God, it's okay. It's uh, what You're really saying is, I don't want it. I can do it without it. But the Shulamite woman knew her desperation. She knew the, the place in her life where she could go no further without an anointing of God. She said, breathe upon me. Breathe upon me. Why? For a ministry? No. To play better? No. For more money? No. She said, so my garden can release its precious odors unto you. So my life can be a witness. My life can be a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Ephesians 1 13 says, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance into the redemption of the purchased possession, into the praise and the glory of God. It's the earnest of our inheritance, folks. The earnest of our inheritance. But yet, we've lost that inheritance because we bought a cheap imitation. We've lost the earnestness of our inheritance because we took on a little silver and gold. We can say silver and gold. We have, but we can't tell that man at the gate beautiful. Rise up and walk. We can't tell those sick people that left this morning, you pray for you, you be healed. We've lost the power of God. We've lost the anointing of God. We've lost the ability when we preach the gospel to put man under conviction of Christ and come back to God once more. We've sold our inheritance, folks. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the earnest of the Christian's inheritance. And we must come back to that today. Oh, oh, we need the Spirit of God to breathe upon us. Breathe upon us. Breathe in this church once more, once again. Galatians 5.25 says, If you live in the Spirit, so walk ye in the Spirit. I'm birthed in this kingdom by the Spirit of God. You're kidding me by the Spirit. But if I live by that Spirit, I must walk in that Spirit. I must be filled and possessed by that Spirit. I must allow Christ to take everything of my life. Here it is, God. You do what you want with it. You can sue in any way that you would have. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, Wherefore, don't, do not be... Do ye not... Don't be don't, start over. Ephesians five seventeen. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. He goes on to say, Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. Don't be unwise, folks. Know the will of God. What's the will of God for my life? What do you want me to do every day? Wake up until you pray until you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Wake up and pray to a fresh baptism, a fresh anointing releases upon your life. Wake up and sing the face of God till you feel the north wind until you feel the south wind. You consume your life. Breathe upon us tonight, oh God. What's the will of God for my life? Don't be unwise, but know it. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. That word is in present tense form. Be being filled continually every day of my life. I was filled with this morning. I must be filled tonight. I was filled last night, but Monday when I go to work, I must must be filled with the Holy Ghost. Brother Eddie, when you're driving that truck, you must be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. Breathe upon me. Breathe upon your people tonight, Jesus. We need the reality of God, folks. We need to get back to an old-fashioned altar and cry out to God, Oh, north wind, blow upon me. Oh, south wind, breathe upon me. We need the breath and the wind of God tonight. She said that my spices... Thereof may flow out. Second Corinthians two fifteen says, For we are a sweet fragrance of Christ, which excels unto God, discernible alike among those who are being saved and among those who are dying and perishing. 
our lives is such a testimony once the Holy Ghost comes and breathes upon us and everywhere that we go, every step that we take, the glory of God falls behind. To my sisters and brothers, they see it upon me. And to a lost and dying world, they say something's different about that man. Something's different about that woman. I heard a, a story. A man said he went to the zoo and they had a tour guide. He was taking him to the zoo. So they went to an eagle exhibit. And the man said, eagles are made to be free. They're made to soar. And that's how a Christian is made. To free to soar. To live above that dominion of sin. Not to be bound to the confines of this world. But all of these eagles were sitting there in their pretty little cages and, and just sitting there all quiet and calm and just beautiful little creatures. But he said there was one over there to the corner. The tour guide didn't say much about. His feathers were tattered. He was bleeding from his leg. He had a chain hooked to him. He just wasn't like the rest of them. He kept trying to get away. He kept trying to get away. And the tour guide made a remark. You can tell which one was born in freedom. The rest of them were born in captivity. Activity. My God, folks, that's how we should be when the Spirit of God breathes upon our lives. The world should look at us and say, something's different about that man. He's not of this earth. He's not like me. Something different tells me that he's born from above. They watched those disciples walk down that street and they said, they, he, they've been with Jesus. They knew something was different about his life. John the Baptist saw Christ and he says, behold, the Lamb of God. There was something different about his life. There was something different to testify. I'm not of this earth. I'm just passing through. I'm going home to be with Jesus one day. Something about their lives testified that they were not like everybody else. Folks, something about our lives should testify that we're not like the rest of this world out there. The breath of God needs to breathe upon us and consume us like never before. We need the Holy Ghost in this last hour more than we've ever needed Him before. We need once more to say, oh, I, the Lord Lord forbid me to sell my inheritance for a cheap imitation. I'm not satisfied with going to church, screaming and shouting a little bit without a reality of the Spirit of God. I want this world to see Jesus high and lifted up. He said, if I'm exalted, I'll draw all men unto me. Men are drawn to He simply not exalted. And He's not exalted because we don't have the baptism like we should. The Bible says when the Comforter comes, when the Holy Ghost comes, He'll reveal Jesus to our lives. And Christ is revealed to our lives truly. He would then be exalted in our lives. We must get back to that place of the reality of God, folks. We must get back to that reality of God. She said, breathe upon me that my spices may go forth from this garden. Spices denote the graces of a believer, the actions, the life of a believer. They're rare, they're precious, and they're odorous. And the flowing out, the exercises of them, their evidence increases and it ripening, and it ripens continuously. When they are diffused, when they diffuse a sweet odor to Christ and others, it makes it delightful to walk in His garden, as it is as it as it is to walk in one after a delightful shower of rain. You walk through a fresh garden after it just rained. It's wonderful to walk into the smells are everywhere. It just overtakes you, and that's how the Bible says it. The Solomon in the Songs of Solomon says it. When Christ walks through His people, full of the Holy Ghost of God, it's beautiful to Him. The odor just overtakes Him. The odor of it just overwhelms His life. Over overwhelms his nostril. Our lives should be a sweet fragrance of a sweet savor going up to God continually. But we need the north wind to blow upon us. We need the south wind to blow upon us. We need the breath of God in this generation once more. Oh, we need the breath of God. The south wind sets our hearts ablaze for God. Just like the fire purifies the gold, that fire brings us to a place of maturity in Christ so our lives can give off that sweet fragrance of God. We must be purified in the fire. And that fire of the south wind purifies us, makes us mature, makes us the vessel that God has called us to be. Matthew 5, 48 says, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That word perfect means maturity. It's only done by the Holy Ghost of God. It's only done by the south wind blowing in us, blowing through us, that the life of Christ may flow flow freely and unhindered in this vessel. That's my true desire. That's my only desire in this earth. That God, you flow through me unhindered, unabated. Whatever you want to do, my God, you do it. But that's not a reality tonight because I've not desperately sought it like I should. I've not given myself to the way, to the magnitude that I should. But tonight, it's time for us to get a hold of the horns of the altar and say, North wind, blow upon me. My God, desperately breathe upon my soul. 
household today. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. My God, we must let our light be seen. We must let a reality of Christ be seen in this last generation. 1 Corinthians six twenty says, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify your God and glorify God in your bodies and in your spirit, which are God's. Everything of my life I owe to Christ. Everything of my soul belongs to Him. He bought me folks with a price. It's no longer mine. I must allow the Spirit of God to freely flow in me and freely flow through me. Philippians two three 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to, to will and to do His good pleasure. It's His good pleasure that He's doing in our lives. He's taking that fragrance, that scent, and it's bringing glory to His name. The Bible says, I, I forget where it's at, one of the Gospels, but it says that Christ is glorified or Christ is honored when His children bear much fruit. It brings God honor and glory when my life produces fruit. It brings God's glory and honor when your life produces much fruit. But I ask you a question. Why don't our lives produce much fruit? Why don't our lives produce the same fruit that we saw in the Zuzu Tree? Why don't our lives produce the same fruit that we saw in the Wells Revival? Why does our lives produce such little fruit? Because you're not giving ourselves to the capacity they gave themselves. We're not begging God every night to make us like Him. We're not begging God every day for the north wind to blow upon us. We're not begging God for the Spirit like they did. My God, folks. There was a man by the name of Robert Murray McFinn, McKean, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he's a great man of God. He died, I believe, at the age of 29. He was a very young man when he died, but he's a great man of God. He saw mighty things happen for God. He was just so powerful and so wonderful for God. And after he died, a preacher went to his home church. And the preacher said, what made your pastor so great? What made him so great with God? He said, come and follow me. So he took him to a back room in the church. And he said, kneel down at this chair. So the man knelt down. And he said, now beg God for four hours to make you like him. Beg God to make you holy. Beg God for Him to breathe upon you. That was the secret of the first century church. That was the secret of the Wells Revival. That was the secret of Azusa Street. That was the secret of the first generation church. That was the secret of every move of God. They asked God. They begged God. Make me like Thee. Breathe upon me. They are nothing different than we are. They are nothing special that we don't have. They didn't have a special star hanging over their crib and make them something that we weren't. They were normal men, normal women, but they said, God, I'm tired of the status quo of religion. I want a reality once more. I'm tired of a stream of sound. I'm tired of a cheap and imitation of the real. I want to see you breathe on me. Oh, north wind blow. South wind come and consume my life. Everything that I have, give me a reality of the Spirit of God once more. God's desire is to breathe upon His people. God's desire is to breathe upon His people. But we must allow Him to breathe on us. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Psalms 84, 2, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the cold of the Lord my God. I ask you, does your soul long? Does it faint just to be in the house of God? Does it faint? Has to be in the presence of the Almighty. Psalms 42 1. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee. That heart is a deer, and the, the, the water to the deer is a source of life. It's a source of everything that it is. Without that water, it will perish in a few days. He says, As the as deer panteth after that water, so my soul pants after thee. How are we in prayer? How am I in prayer? Does my soul pant after the Spirit of God that come and consume me? Do I bear God earnestly breathe upon this vessel. How is it with you? How is it with me? God, give us a hunger. Give us a thirst. Give us a greater desire for the things of God. Are we comfortable? Are we satisfied with just praying church? Or do we desire more of God? Well, it's time to be about the master's business, folks. We don't have much time. He's coming back any moment. He's coming back any minute. And your children are lost. Your grandchildren are lost. My family's lost because I've not given them a reality of God. 19 years I grew up in a church and I never had a reality of God. But one day a man made him real to me. My God, let us be that man. Let us be that woman to say I refuse to stay in the status quo of religion. I refuse to just go through the motions. I want God to be real in this generation. We must come back to that place of God. Psalms 107.9 
For He satisfied the longing soul, and He filled up the hungry souls with goodness. Luke 1, 53, He, he hath filled the hungry with good things, and, and the rich He hath sent away empty. The Bible, the church of today says we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. But He said you're naked, you're empty, you're destitute. You have nothing of a reality of God. We must get back to that point. We're like Pope Innocent II, silver and gold. We can't say we don't have any more. But like that young man replied, neither can you say to the lame, rise up and walk. We must understand it and come to grips with that today. Psalm 63, 1. O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee, my soul thirsteth. My soul, my soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longed for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. There was a man talking about his church one day. He said, my church is dry and I'm not even thirsty. How many of the church is dry and not even thirsty? I'm thirsty Sunday. I'm thirsty Monday. Tuesday a little bit. Wednesday and thirst comes with Thursday. No. Friday, no. Saturday, no. Where is the hunger? Where is the thirst? Where is the desire to see God move in my life? Where is the longing to say, God, possess me. Let my life be a cloven tongue of fire. Where I walk, I want you to be glorified. The words I speak, I want you to be honored. Everything of my life, God, I want I want you to be exalted. Where is that hunger? Where is that desire? Even in my own life, I'm preaching to a mirror today, folks. I'm looking at myself. Where is it? Where is it in me? Where is it in my life? Amen. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Amos 5, 4 says, This is what the Lord says to the house of Israel. Seek me. And live. If you want to live, Israel, seek me. Church of the 21st century, if you want to leave, seek God. Yeah. Seek Christ with everything that you are. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Psalms 2, 8. Ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen with an inheritance in the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. We all know that this is a prophecy of Christ. We all know that this speaks of Christ. But we don't understand what it means to ask. We don't know what that word meant for Christ to ask. It meant He had to go to Calvary. For Christ to ask the Father, give me that heathen for my inheritance. It meant He had to die on a wooden cross. Folks, it cost Christ everything to ask. What makes you think you're different? You're no greater than your Master. I'm no greater than my Master. If I'm going to ask God for the wind to blow, I must be willing to die for that wind to come. The day of Pentecost, God promised them something. They didn't fully understand what it was, but they went to an upper room hungry to receive whatever God had for them. I don't know what it cost me. I don't know where to bring me. I don't know the, 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 the jungles that it might take me to. I don't know the, the alleyways it might bring me to. But I am willing to say, God, whatever it takes, wherever it costs, wherever you bring me, I want to go. I want to do Thy will. I want to be a, a tool, a servant in the hand of my Master. Yeah. There's only one solution to the problem. That's of this generation. We need a wind of God to blow upon us. There's only one solution to the sin problem out there in our streets. There's only one solution to the problem out there. It's a wind of God to breathe upon us. The breath of God to breathe upon His people. I was reading a statistic the other day and it said there are 27 million slaves on this earth today. There's more slaves than any one time in history. We have more slaves today than there ever were in history at any one time. And a million of them live in America today. Most of them are prostitutes. Cities next to you, large cities in America. I know Houston's one of them. It says it's a hub for uh, human trafficking. We don't know anything about it. Because we don't know the true heart of God. We've not sit at His feet. We've not ever let Him reveal these things to us. We've not come to the place where we say, God, let me be your vessel. Let me be the one who intercedes for these lives. A million slaves walk the streets where you walk. A million of them. My God, that breaks my heart, folks. A million of them. This statistic was from the CIA and the U.S. State Department. The U.S. State Department says every year, 17,000 new slaves come to America. Every Every single year. My God, folks. Do you see the sin of this world? Do you see the wickedness of this last day? We need a move of God. We need something to happen. And the only thing that's going to change it is a wind of God. The only thing that's going to change it is the north wind to blow upon my life. The north wind to blow upon your life. The sin abounds. The Bible says where sin abounds, the grace of God 
does much more about I'm excited today. I hear about the sin. It breaks my heart to see the wickedness. It breaks my heart to see all these things. But I know God is true to His Word. But the sin abounds. The grace of God does much more about If I allow God to let me be the vessel that He's called me to be, we can see revival. A lot of preachers preach uh, gloom and doom, but I believe God will pour out His Spirit one more time. The Bible says the latter will be greater than the former. He'll not come back for anything less than He started with. He started with a mighty move of God. He'll finish with a mighty move of God. It might not sweep the billions into the kingdom of God, but we will see the glory of God manifested in a reality once more in this generation. But the only question is, will you be a part of it? Will I be a part of it? Will I allow God to breathe and blow upon me? Will I allow God to do everything that He wants to do in me again? Just let God come again. His very presence. Get our eyes off of the miracles. Get our eyes off of the signs and wonders. And seek God for God. That was a quote by Leonard Ravenhill. B.H. Clinton, and he quoted, he said, where is his that? Seek, seek Him for Himself and not His gifts. Just seek God for God and not His gifts. God, whatever you want to do, I want you. You can heal the sick man, but if you don't, I must have a reality of you. God, we need these great things done in this generation, but right now in our presence, but if you don't do it, God, make me, make you real to me. Make you real to me. Breathe upon my life. Breathe upon this vessel. David Wilkerson said, there's so many people wanting the provisions of God without the presence of God. That's the mark of this church. We are unfaithful to God in the second mark. We want the provisions of God without the presence of God. God healed my sick arm of cancer, but God don't come any closer to me. I want to live in the miracles of God, but I don't want to climb Mount Sinai. You see, the children of Israel, when they were brought out of Egypt, they said they were going to Canaan. But Moses said, I brought you out of Egypt to bring me to Sinai. I brought you out of Egypt to worship me in the desert. I brought you out of Egypt, not for Canaan, not for the promised land, not for heaven, but to worship Him, to meet with Him. And they went to Sinai. God met a, a, had an appointment for him. They had a set up a meeting for him. Where the Bible said they stood far off at their tent and said, Moses, you go in, but we won't go in. We don't want to go into the presence of God. We don't want to know God in a greater and a deeper way. Why? They were comfortable in their sin. They were comfortable where they're at. They didn't want the Holy Ghost to expose the sinfulness of their lives for what it was. But we must come to the point, God, no matter how gruesome it may look, no matter how much it may break me, I know you're only breaking me to heal me. I know you're only breaking me to fill me. Clinton said he went to a church that was so dry. He said he had, he had, he had, but he had to hack before he could pour in the oil. My God, he has to hack the hard heart. He has to break us of who we are before he can pour in the oil of the Holy Ghost. Let the north wind blow. Let the south wind blow. Let God breathe upon his people when once more, we've attempted to have His provisions without Himself, and, it's, and it got us into a spiritual mess. We are now trying to mimic the things of God. We desperately need a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. We sold our inheritance for a cheap imitation. We're trying to do the strength things of God and the power and the strength of the flesh. But folks, it does not work like that. He only works by one means and one way, and we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Yes. In this generation, most preachers are an echo of God instead of being a voice of God. We must once more become the voice of God in this generation. I do believe God is raising up a generation people with the heart of Gideon. God, you say I'm a mighty man of valor. You say you're with me. Where are your signs and wonders? Where is your hand extended? Where is the reality of the presence of God? God is raising up a people with that heart. God is raising up a generation that will say, God, whatever you want to do, do it in me. I went to Malaysia, one place specifically. I don't know why it stuck out to me. We left uh, Indonesia and we flew to Malaysia. We were going to do some conferences there, me and Brother Josh. And we were there. About to preach, we got to the hotel at 10 o'clock that night. It was a modernized city where we were staying at. And when we went there, there were young people everywhere. I saw them tattoos, drinking, smoking, everything of sin. It was 10 o'clock at night. I looked across the across from the hotel. There was a church. Looked down the street. There was a church. We drove down the street a ways there. Churches everywhere. Pentecostal churches, Baptist churches, Methodist churches. Churches everywhere, but the streets are filled and flooded with people lost. People 
desiring something of a reality. They went to the house of God. They knocked on the door and they didn't find anything of any sustenance. So they went to the world, filled themselves with tattoos, filled themselves with drugs and alcohol, trying to satisfy hunger, trying to satisfy something in their lives. And I believe God wants to fill that generation. I believe God wants to touch that generation. I believe God wants to let them know you can have a reality. You can experience Him in a greater way. But it's only going to be by people. If God's ever moved in this earth, it's been through a vessel. And He's going to move today. He needs a vessel. Will you be the vessel? Will I be the vessel? He's a burden of my heart. God has placed it upon me. Chris, be the vessel of God. Don't be an echo anymore. But be a voice. The voice of God. Breaks the seeds of Lebanon. It melts the earth. It melts the hearts and lives of men. It makes men conformable in the hands of God once more. It brings man to the state of Adam. He can just mold him and make him to whatever he wanted to him, uh, what Adam to be. Let us be that voice once more. Let us be the voice of God that breaks the cedars of Lebanon. Let us be the voice of God and melts the earth in this generation. Let us have a reality of Christ once more. Let us be the voice of God. Psalms 24, 6. This is the generation of them that seek Him, that seek thy face. O Jacob, this is the generation. I believe there is a specific generation. I believe this is it. This is the last generation. This must be it. We must be the generation that seeks God until God makes Himself real. There's a quote that says, You must be the change you wish to see in the world. If I want to see Pentecost in the world, if I want to see a revival take place in the world, the revival must start in me. There's a preacher that Josh talks about quite often. He said the preacher would go into a city and he would get in just, just a small little space and said, God, bring revival to this area. Bring revival to this circle. Bring revival to my life. Because he knew a revival could come to him. He could give it to somebody else. The day of Pentecost afterwards, the disciples left. They said, such as I have, I give unto you. They had revival placed in them so they could bring revival to the world. The wind of God had breathed upon them. That breath had breathed upon them. And they had something to offer a world. I ask you, do you have something to offer a world? Do I have something? And to offer a world. And echo, you can hear it faintly when it goes out. A little people hear it. A few people hear it. But the masses don't hear it. And the masses are dying and going to hell today. What about the one million slaves in, this, in, this, in America? What about the 50 million babies that are being aborted every year around this world? What about them? What about the people? What about those mothers that are that are having those abortions? What about the people that are hurting? What about the two billion that have never heard the gospel before? In Malaysia, it's built up of 12 states. Me and Brother Josh went to two of those states because only two were open to the gospel. Ten are closed to the gospel forever. There's two that are open. And when we were there, they were trying to close those two. The government only allowed a, a specific amount of people to have Bibles. They printed the Bibles. They, 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 they handled all of those things. They're trying to shut out Christ. If we don't bring them reality soon, my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? North Korea will not allow any gospel to be preached. But one of us pray, bring down the stronghold of North Korea so a man like Josh can get in. So a man like one of you can get in. Somebody, do the will of God. Will somebody say, God, breathe upon me. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes, God, break this old stinking flesh. Whatever you want to do with it, do it. Just breathe on my life. Just send the word of God upon me. Let God be seen in this generation. Let God be made real once more. Give us a reality of Christ. That's what we need, folks, desperately. I beg of you to hear my heart. I beg of you to hear me. There's a song. I, I just love the song so much. The songs, I'm, gonna repeat, I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to just tell you the words to it. The song says, I'm tired of the same old thing. I'm tired of the traditions were in your name. I'm tired of man-made worship hour. I'm tired of a song with no praise. Where worshiping you seems out of place. I'm tired of a religious formality. I'm tired. Folks, it's at your heart today. I'm tired of coming to church singing worship songs that don't worship God. They worship the man playing the guitar or the person singing. We worship worship more than we worship God. I'm tired of all the same old routine. I'm tired i tired of not experiencing Christ. Every time we walk in the doors, the Bible says in Christ hung on the cross, He said it is finished. The Bible says the veil rent from the top to the bottom and the Spirit of God was released upon the whole entire earth. It was no longer bound to just a room. No longer bound to just a tabernacle. But everybody, every man, boy, woman, and girl can experience the manifest presence of God at any moment in time. But yet, how often do we live 
outside of the presence of God. Amen. Every day we can enter into the holiness of holies, but how many days do I refuse to enter into it? How many times have God, has God woken me up? Three in the morning, I looked at the clock, God, it's too early. I'm not praying. How many times have I refused the breath and wind of God? How many times have you refused God moving and dealing with your life? My God, folks, we've bought a cheap imitation. We've sold our inheritance and it's left us naked. It's left us destitute. We must have a revival. We must have an outpouring of the Spirit of God once more. My cries, wind of God, breathe upon me. Oh, south wind, blow upon my life. Breathe on me in this place. We need the wind of God, church. We need the wind of God. Find a place to pray.